Hello, you're listening to People, Pets, and Vets with Dr. Brad Miller and registered veterinary technician Angel Martin. Hello, everyone. Each week, we bring you current events and news in the veterinary industry and share our thoughts and perspective on how they impact us in our animal hospital. We also try to give you an insight and behind-the-scenes glance at our clinic and the people who work in it. This episode 109 is once again being brought to you by Georgia Veterinary Associates, a family of animal hospitals caring for your family pet. So once again, broadcasting uh, from beautiful, starting to become hot lana like Lawrenceville, Georgia. It is really hot these days. So humidity is still there, approaching 90 degrees, all of a sudden uh summer's here it feels starting like. to feel like summer absolutely when, when is summer officially when does it officially begin do you know it's usually the, uh, the summer solstice like june 20th 21st something like that okay but yeah definitely feels like that starting this past weekend so um i don't know lots going on Let, let's real briefly talk about uh gva georgia veterinary associate news um two new graduates are going to be onboarding with us in june Yes, veterinary graduates. Veterinarians, yep. Two new associates we will have join us. Uh, Dr. Brian Yee, who is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and Dr. Megan Seek, uh, who is a graduate of Iowa State. Exactly. And so Yee and Seek. Yes. Hide and Seek. <laughs> so her name, I, I, gosh, I was so embarrassed when I was speaking with her that the last day she visited with us i i misspelled it i misspoke it i just couldn't get it right but it's s-i-e-c-h yes seek it's german she said um and she is originally from the midwest has a lot of family in south dakota but also uh family in iowa uh hence the reason she went uh, to vet school in iowa state but Iowa her parents State. live here in in her parents the live Beaver area, I yeah, think. in uh, I think Norcross area, mm. so just uh, north of uh, Atlanta. So anyway, we're super excited to have both of them joining us. Um, looking forward to uh, having our staff interact with them more and our clients and patients uh, really getting to know them. So super super cool. Um, I guess the other big piece of news is we have decided to quote-unquote open our lobby uh, at all four hospitals to let the general public back in and mask will be optional uh, but we will encourage clients who are well yeah encourage or allow or we're fine with people to come in not wearing a mask uh, you know as long as they're following the CDC guidelines I think we'll have a mixed bag of emotions and thoughts from both our staff and our clients you know um but just like when we close the doors there's no way to make everybody happy so as we did when we decided to close the doors we just basically lean on the guidance from the cdc and other entities like the avma and other veterinary specific i guess avenues throughout the country so Um, this is kind of weird that since the cdc came out with this um there have been federal thoughts there have been state thoughts and there have been cdc guidelines yes private businesses can still require you to wear a mask or they could you know remain curbside that that remains our option but this is being taken almost like a federal man not a mandate but it, it is kind of on the federal level in my opinion because super weird locally here all, all of a sudden you know one day mask required do not enter the enter and then the you know the next day completely wide open whether that's Costco, you know, restaurants, uh, Kroger, uh, I, I, I think, don't know. It's weird to yes me. Yes, no. I think just... a lot of it is social, right? So, like, we had a lead meeting, and one of the doctors on Friday said, like, they get, like, are we going to post that we are mask, you know, encouraged or optional um, based on the CDC guidelines? Because she found that when she and her family are out, they kind of look to the masses and see what the masses are doing. Like if they're going to a place and they wear a mask because other people are wearing a mask. So I think it's very social like that. I too was at Costco this weekend and uh, it was it was probably 50-50 when I was there um, early Saturday morning. Yeah. 
with people masked and not masked. Nobody knows. Nobody knows the exact right thing to do. And we do have to have somebody giving us, evidently, we have to have somebody giving us guidelines because we can't think for ourselves. Um, well, we can think for ourselves. But we but don't. We, we, we hopefully attribute don't. that they have more knowledge than we do in regards to the disease, the contagious factor, all of that, right? I so. definitely get that. Different levels of thought and education and understanding of what's going on. But um, who determined, if you can answer this question, then I will, I will quit uh, belaboring the point. <laughs> I will anyway. But who determined that six feet is the proper social distancing, uh, that, that it can't be 6.1 or 5, you know, 5 foot 11 inches. It doesn't, it's not 8 feet. It's not 7 feet. Who determines 6 feet is the absolute distance that we should socially distance? So I would assume it was the coronavirus task force back early March, Fauci April. Fauci and yeah. Burks and with the help of the CDC. Mike Red, Pence. Red, Redmond was the CDC director then. So mm-hmm. my point is we don't know. We, we do make assumptions. We try to use our knowledge base to, you know, make these recommendations. But, you know, whatever the date was, May the 14th or thereabouts, 13th, you know, we're all wearing masks. Well, uh, well, a week prior to that, it was it was recommended if you're an outside event and you're vaccinated, then you don't need to wear a mask. And then roughly a week later, now if you're inside and vaccinated, same thing. So bam, wide open, which is good. It's it's a better way for us to kind of get back to normal. That's what we have decided as well. I'm I'm sitting here like hammering these decisions, but we've decided the same thing. We're not going to transition necessarily back. Mm-hmm. We're going to try to open our lobby. And uh, some staff may be wearing masks, some may not. Some clients are going to wear a mask, some are not. But we're going to go back to normal. Otherwise, although we will still offer curbside care for those who are concerned about coronavirus or it's just more convenient for them to come up and have us come get their pet, whether they wait on them or not. So. Sure. And certainly I think we'll also start to see a little bit more of the traditional drop-off appointments where people don't wait in their car for their pet. They actually just drop it off. We work it in between our other tasks that day and then give them a call when it's ready. That that's been kind of an amazing thing. I noticed, um, our staff would get really upset when a client would come for a curbside appointment and would leave. And I'm not really sure why. Well, so originally I always attributed to like when they've left, we usually have them sign a drop-off form, right? Basically just indicating that the pet is left in our care and they give us a valid phone number to reach them at. But now they're dropping off with a valid phone number because we have to contact them. At some points they weren't though. Um, So I think that's where the frustration kind of came from. We were doing video chats, you know, we're doing those virtual visits as well. So, man, we've come a long way in 14 months. Um, Yeah. This is going to, obviously, history is history. Everything's historical. Right. But this is going to be talked about for a long, long time. And I just wonder, you know, what's next? What's the next crazy thing that's going to happen? Going back, you and I talked about COVID-19. Back in, in the December fall. and January. Yeah. Well, no, before that. I mean, it was it was 19. We were, yeah, we were talking about it in I don't even remember when it started, but I feel like October, November, December. We yeah, were but to we, read I definitely recall like bringing up some Chinese stories about how they were culling dogs, you know, and all this kind of thing over in China due to this rare disease that mm-hmm. they thought came from bats Jumped and all from of that. Bats to people. And then suddenly, yeah, it skipped over the ocean and it's in our front door. Yeah. So. Wonder what's happened with the mink population. You know, that was a uh, in the in the news quite a bit. Many many mink farms were depopulated to try to control the disease uh, because they were affected. But I've I've not heard anything about that. I know they were doing some vaccination testing and that kind of thing as well. Vaccinating the mink? I don't know about minks What do you call a group of of minks? Monks? Mink? Monk? Minks? Well, you just called them minks. Minks, I guess. Okay. All right. Um, Before we jump into news stories, I, I picked three... Pretty good ones, I thought. Um, healthy pet, happy life. So, okay. we, I feel like we've talked about this in many, many times before, but we are going to kind of make a push um, for, we're going to continue to push our clients to make the right decision for them and their pet. Um, 
by getting their annual exams, their annual recommended vaccines based on their and their pet's lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, we've always recommended in the South, you know, year-round heartworm prevention and year-round flea and tick prevention. And so we're going to continue to do that. And then the last kind of thing we are adding um, is uh, cuddles and, and love and hugs, right? So love your pet. Your pet will love you. The happier they are, the happier you are. And one of the tools we're going to be rolling out, hopefully relatively soon, is going to be a, a, a T-shirt um, that we're going to give our compliant clients uh, for them to wear. Right. Right. So that so. whole happy, healthy pet, happy life, right? Like it's it's a happy life for for both the owner and the pet. It goes both ways. And so you were saying that as you um, are, it was coming to my brain as you were saying it. The I guess the House and the Senate just passed like a pause for Veterans Act as well, um, where they are trying to mitigate suicide or kind of lower the suicide rate of mm-hmm. veterans by offering them pets. Um, so to your point, pets do make you happy. Oh, they do. I mean, look at the pandemic, right? I mean, look at the huge numbers of new pets that people acquired when they were staying at home. Um, maybe they were stressed. Maybe they were bored. They were probably a little bit of both. But that that just really goes to show you what that human-animal bond means to many, many people and how important pets are. We, we again, talked many, many episodes ago about pets. Uh, pets used to be working animals they weren't even i don't even know if they were called companion animals which is what we call our our field and the the pets that we see right um i mean honestly maybe a dog was a dog yeah working working dog and and then they eventually evolved um into more of a family pet or maybe a one person pet yeah and so maybe now it's fair to say they have become a family pet they are a member of the family so you know maybe they they were a family pet and now now they are looked at as members of the family good and bad right it's awesome of course they get clothes bought for them they get all these you know supposedly good foods bought for them that aren't always the best um and then maybe on a negative aspect, sometimes they're overhumanized to where they're treated more like people than they should be. Um, and sometimes they act like people who shouldn't be acting like that, right? Well, sure. So, yeah, we start to see some behavior issues when they are not necessarily, I guess. So story, I, I, on my way into work this past week uh, at 7.15, 7.30, I'm, I'm pulling out of my neighborhood And I see this lady walking her uh, doodle, must have been a a golden doodle, Mm -hmm. and it's about a 45-pound dog, probably six, seven, eight months of age. And what catches my eye is, you know that little strip of grass between the curb and the sidewalk in Mm -hmm. most subdivisions? Yeah. This dog is planted on that strip of grass, sitting down, head up, leash tight, it is looking at her and refusing to get up or do anything. Oh, my gosh. And she's looking at the dog, and she's gently tugging. Come on, come on. You can just you know, almost see her lips saying, come on. And the dog is just looking at her. Um, I don't know if it's you know giving her the middle finger. I don't know <laughs> the silent treatment. I'm not sure what. But I, I just, I'm like, oh, my gosh. We've said this before, too. We are going to really be in for the, the behavioral challenges. Of course. Um, post pandemic are going to be huge Mm -hmm. so uh again maybe we're treating this pet a little bit too much like a human like it has an option to sit there versus i know i want you to go ahead and and leash walk with me right Uh, so i don't know it was it was was weird so i think i told you about the little dog in my neighborhood as well and i've passed it a couple times in the morning uh usually these people are out walking 7 7 15 in the morning when i'm when i'm leaving my house so um they have like a little i don't know Shih Tzu, Lhasa, Opso, like mix. So probably a 12 to 15 pound dog. Um, it's a husband and wife that walk the dog. And the first time I saw it, it was actually, you know, I, I kind of giggled a little, but then I, I thought it, about it a little bit more and it's actually pretty sad. But I drove by and the dog like flattened out. Like it was terrified mm. of the car. Um, and so 
I don't know if they were walking it because they thought it would be fun or if they were walking it trying to socialize it or kind of get it wrecked. Like, but it obviously was startled by it a vehicle. It was so huh. terrified by the car. And huh. so uh, I've passed it a couple other times. And so it, it is not necessarily like flattening out super submissive anymore when I drive by. Uh, but it definitely does stop dead in its tracks uh, so much so that it actually stops the people. Right. Huh. So. Um, I would hope that they are trying to desensitize the dog, but I, I don't know that that's necessarily their goal. But yeah, the first time I saw it, I was so sad for the dog in the sense that it had that no it was idea. That, yeah, anxious yeah. or afraid and try to get as small as it could by just yeah. like, like just hitting the ground. So, yeah. uh, real quick, okay. I didn't physically talk. I've texted. Do you remember our uh, former study group member, Todd Hughes from Conejo? Valley the Hospital. Yeah. So he listened. I don't know if I told you this or not. He listened to our podcast, um, maybe the last episode, and he he shot me a text the other day. It's like, oh, I listened to your and Angel's podcast. That was really cool. And then we went on to to chat about a couple of other things. So. Oh, that's cool. I wonder how he, I, I didn't ask him how he found that, but hopefully, you know, we continue to kind of spread our wings and. Uh, yeah, I would hope so. So, do you remember one of the veterinarians that worked? at his practice or actually still works at Conejo Vet Evan Anton, is yes. yeah, Dr. Evan Anton. So yeah. he has like a animal planet show. Now he's writing books. He's, um, very much like an animal advocate, both for wildlife and companion animals. Right, right. Um, so also was, I think people's like sexiest veterinarian alive or something like yeah, that. I forget. I mean, it's, it's been a few, but, but, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie. He's a good looking man. So, uh, whatever <laughs> that means, but, uh, it's, it's, in our industry, there are so few people that put themselves out there, you know, as he has done or right. as the, you know, air quotes, industry leaders, uh, the speakers on the circuits. Um, well, so there's a difference, in my opinion, between Evan Anton and like, quote unquote, industry leaders. Right. So I think he's focused on animal welfare and educating the public more so than the industry itself. Does that make sense? I agree. I'm just saying, though, to get up in front of a camera oh, for sure. or a room full of 200 people or 2,000 people, or it, yeah, that's not really the style of most veterinarians. Right. So uh, anyway, just wanted to shout out to Todd, and uh, maybe Todd, Charlie, and Andrew and I are going to try to get together in October. So, That'd be fun. Um, so real quick, though, speaking about like quote-unquote industry leaders in that, so I listened to a podcast myself this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a member of a ton of different groups on Facebook for veterinary managers, RVTs, um, veterinary support staff, you name it. I just try to keep involved in like what's going on and who's saying what. But um, in one of the management groups, there was this like, you have to listen to this onboarding, uh, staff onboarding podcast. Like if you do nothing else, you've got to listen to this. So Debbie Hill is the, is a CVPM. She's from someplace in Florida. Yep. Three manages three practices. Yeah. Way. It's a multi practice uh, or multi location practice as well. So I definitely think that she has a lot of information to offer, but it was just so disappointing listening to the podcast that like they swore that you needed to listen to to like before you hired your next staff member. And then it was basically like common sense. So was it, let me, let me, okay. So we're not bashing her. No, not at all. Podcast. Or that podcast. But uh, I, I, so let's, yeah, let's put that disclaimer or that claimer. Definitely out there. not. Uh, but a lot of so we could talk about behavior we can talk about practice management hr a lot of this is using your common sense right and maybe you don't know it until you hear it then you're like oh yeah that that makes a lot of sense um so hire for your needs hire for personality not experience you can you can train the right person to do anything mentor and have a formal training program and give them time give them time to grow and hold them accountable and coach them up i mean basically yes, basically yes basically that was it so make sure that you are your staff obviously doesn't mean girl them out oh and then also yes i forgot have your staff be involved in the interview process yes not necessarily interview process but like the onboarding of the yeah. new staff member right so i guess my point with all of this is that this whole quote unquote industry leadership, it's truly just those people that are willing to put themselves out yep. there. I would agree. Um, because not that I know everything or I'm all knowing, I'm certainly not. But a lot of times when I've listened to things like that, to your point, it is very common sense, but they've put it in a pattern. Yep. 
And so it's they it's nothing groundbreaking. It. Yes. It's nothing like, yes. you know, earth shattering. It doesn't change your life by listening to it, but it does patternize it a little bit and make it repeatable, which I think is pretty genius. But I don't know. To your point with the whole industry leader thing, I was just I listened yeah. to that podcast this morning and I thought it was great. Um, so maybe, but yeah, I thought maybe it was the also nothing like content crazy. is known, but it, it is in the presentation, right? So, right. you know, recently I was at a meeting, I had a great idea to present, and I thought it was just brilliant, but I did such a horrible job in presenting it, nobody <laughs> could follow me. Of course, you yeah. know, and I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. yeah. So anyway, um, okay. Evidently, this is going to be a long podcast because we were 20 minutes in. Maybe we can shorten the stories a little bit. So first story, uh, Laverdia is a new oral treatment for canine lymphoma or lymphosarcoma, a uh, very common type of cancer we see in dogs primarily. We can see it in cats, but uh, not the systemic form involving all the nodes. But uh, MWI has, I guess they're, I was going to say they have come up, they are not, they're vending the product, uh, which is uh, supposedly very targeted to the cancer cells, kind of a new uh, methodology, if you will, and supposedly safe, effective, it's two doses, I believe, given uh, a week at home, I don't really know how, you know, how long you do that, but I'm excited to learn more about that, it is a conditional treatment, Mm -hmm. so kind of like the COVID vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine, that is technically conditional because the need for the vaccine was so great that before they could get a a ton of data to prove the effectiveness, they came out with the product. And so we've had that historically in veterinary medicine. We had a a dental disease vaccine that came out uh, by Pfizer. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I'm going to say the coronavirus vaccine is very similar, uh, but this would be... I'd be very interested to uh, to learn more about this if we can line somebody up to come speak to our doctors group and I'm also that we could. see when it's going to be available. Yeah, so the one thing I guess for me specifically that sticks out is this Laveridia-CA1. So is that similar to our like our Adipi? To your point, you said that this is like a different approach. Is this going to be like? Um... I'm gonna I'm gonna say I don't know is the real answer, but CA1, CA probably stands for K9. Uh, one is maybe, you know, in case there's a two, three, or four. I don't I don't know, though. Um, again, I think we need to learn. I clicked on the, when I was kind of pulling this to, to talk about, I clicked on the learn more uh, about the, they're calling it SINE technology, um, and it didn't really go into more information. So very new product. Very similar. So Jen James' boyfriend, Brad, you know, their dog is being treated by us for osteosarcoma with kind of a new, uh, still kind of in the clinical trial uh, protocol, uh, a new osteosarcoma treatment. So uh, I don't know. It's just exciting times that things continue to evolve and be available and tried for us to try to um, improve our patient care. Yeah, super crazy. Um Sniffer dogs learning to smell coronavirus. We talked about this probably at the heat games, nine, right? Is it Miami Heat? Oh, we, yeah, we talked about it for sports events. Um, and so before coronavirus, we had talked about uh, bomb sniffing dogs, drug sniffing dogs, uh, seizure detecting dogs, and I've always wondered how they really train these dogs to do this. I think I think that would be fascinating to kind of see that process in dogs in different stages of learning this. But uh, this article put out by National Geographic, um, it's basically about a group of five dogs at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, they have been training these dogs to sniff out coronavirus. And... The dogs' names are Tuca, Grizz, Toby, Rico, and Roxy. And they all are at different levels, and they all um, they do things a little bit differently and in different speeds. But uh, the cool thing is they have trained dogs. I'm not sure if it's these particular dogs, but they have trained dogs in the past to detect the coronavirus in urine and... Oh, what were the three? 
the dogs are finding coronavirus because of the volatile organic compounds within it. And so there was urine, one other bodily fluid, and then now they're working on sweat because most, if not all, people are going to sweat. And if they are infected and the dogs can detect the, the coronavirus in sweat, then they don't have to get a sample from the people, right? They can just kind of walk by and try to detect it. And so, That's so crazy. So do they put people through like sweat tests, you know, like, yeah, um, I don't know how they got the sample. Well, yeah, I'm not really sure how they got the samples. That's a really good question. I guess <laughs> people who were known infected, uh, they would take something and scrape or collect a little sweat and then they would put it on cloth. And so the process on, where's it at? It says they collected t-shirts from the study for the study from volunteers. From volunteers who evidently had coronavirus. And then they basically, it's just a positive reinforcement. They would put out like five samples of different products. One would be alcohol, one would be coronavirus. Three might be chocolate, four would be, you know, who knows, cheese crackers, whatever. And then when the dogs would pick the coronavirus sample, they would get a positive reward. Hmm. And so to me, that's totally random. Right. If they go, if, if coronavirus is in container three, do you just let them sniff one to, you know, point on it, whatever. And then ultimately when they find Corona, you reward them. And then you just keep repetitively doing that over and over again. Was oh, that I called no Pav- Pavlovian theory or something along those no lines? Idea. But I don't know. I think that would be fascinating. But um, urine, saliva and sweat. And so... The study goes on to say that in an April study, 96% accuracy in urine and saliva. Oh, wow. Um, not quite that accurate on the sweaty T-shirts, but that's what they're working towards. And so, yeah, the hopes are at a sporting event, at an airport, like you would have a bomb-sniffing dog, you would have a corona-sniffing dog. My hope is that in three to six months, we don't have to worry about this anymore and it kind of goes away. Yeah, but the science is still there, right? So it's pretty cool. I think in that article they were talking about how they have dogs that are sniffing out like Parkinson's disease and diabetes and some of these other things. You know, we talked about dogs that can sense a seizure coming on that pre-ictal phase. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, very, very, very cool. Um, We knew it was happening, but yeah, just to kind of read a little bit more about that. So you brought up the National Geographic, so I wanted to bring up something as well in regards to National Geographic, right? So I don't know if you know, but a year ago or so, maybe two years ago, I signed up for magazines because I wanted to stay relevant and I wanted to understand like what was happening in the world. But um, apparently May 20th was National Bee Day. Did you know that? Like World Bee Day? Not national, but world. Yeah. Okay. Like buzzing bees. So apparently Angelina Jolie covered herself in bees to raise awareness to World Bee Day uh, for the National Geographic magazine. So you can find that on her Twitter or National Geographic's Twitter and that kind of thing. Did they just like, I think she was like, her, wearing had, clothes, but she was like, like definitely something to letting, attract them. I've, I've yeah. seen those pictures of people. They say that they're super heavy whenever like they swarm like on your head, your neck. Was she wearing a mask, a no, helmet? No, 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 no. This is just like her, and she's letting these bees. I don't think that they're gonna like sting her or whatnot. She's just letting them kind of like stand on her okay, and like, she's crawl not over completely her. Covered. No, okay, no, she's it's not, not. It's not very attractive. She's anyway. not completely covered like you're talking about when you're in a beekeeper suit. Yeah, and you, and they just uh, that's so heavy, evidently. Yeah. Uh, so this is World Bee Day, and basically she is raising awareness. They want to build 2,500 beehives and restock 125 million bees by 2025. Bees are extremely, extremely important to our ecosystem. Yes. They yes, really, they really are. are. So uh, that's one of those minor, it's kind of like a cruciate ligament, an ACL or a cranial cruciate ligament. Little bitty thing, part of a, the big organism, but extremely important. Yeah. So, um, all right, last story is going to be the, uh, oh, the pandemic pet poisonings. So, I found this brief article pretty enlightening, but it all makes sense, right? Yeah, I would agree. I thought, you know... Definitely their their number one is not at all what I expected it to be. What would you have guessed the number one uh, pet poisoning to be 
over the past 12 months had you not read the article? I would have thought food of some sort, like chocolates, candies, something like that, you know, because people are, you know, we eat to feel better. Yep. It's just who we are. I think I would have thought food as well. Uh, plants would have entered my mind, but not top. You know, probably food and, and chocolate would be. Yeah, I would have. Um, I would have thought for sure, like chocolates, that kind of thing. So, but the reality is, um, it is related to the pandemic mm-hmm. pretty heavily in foods, as we're saying, but not mm-hmm. the foods we thought. Exactly. And then, what were people doing during the pandemic? Right. So if you if you think along those lines, what happened during the pandemic? Um, I shared the fact that my coffee habit is like completely out of control. <laughs> uh, coffee is not on the list. It is actually number two. Oh, it is. It mm-hmm. is. Yeah, I missed that. So brewed coffee is number two. Yep. Um, coffee's primarily a GI stimulant or a neuro stimulant, uh, and we're not going to go into the whole. You know what these what mean happens. and do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, if you if your pet has ingested uh, or been exposed to anything you think is toxic, you need to call your veterinarian. So we're gonna leave that at that. But number one, yeast. I know. As I would have never ever thought. Bread. Yes. Um, you know how sweet that rising dough is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see. So all over the place. I feel like. Things that we did during the pandemic, we stayed, many of us were not essential, and so we stayed home for whatever reason. And so when we stayed home, what did we do? We cooked. We drank. I feel like the whole bread making thing, like, went viral for a minute, though. Like Yes, I I didn't see that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there was, like, a bread making deal. So we ate. We baked. We drank. Uh, evidently, some people smoked a little more than they used to. We had art projects. Uh, we cleaned. Um, and number nine is interesting. D three rat poisoning. <laughs> yeah. Basically, that was number nine. So were people at home seeing rodents more, or were there more rodents for because they were home barbecuing? You know, outside. I don't know. But so number one was yeast at two hundred and twenty-two percent increase. Two hundred twenty-two percent increase. Brewed coffee, two hundred seven percent increase. I'm assuming year over year. Um, so ye- what's the difference between yeast and bread dough? So I would think the yeast before baker's yeast and bread dough are in our top three. I would think the yeast would be bef- before it actually made it to the okay, dough. Okay, before they cooked it and made the bread. Okay, um, and. The yeast part of that, whether it's the bread being baked in the dog's stomach or, you know, the, the yeast itself, uh, is broken down into alcohol. So it, it was causing, or will cause, can cause alcohol poisoning. Uh, and bloat, apparently. But bloat, yeah, if they, yeah. If they, because the stomach kind of acts like an oven and it expands. Yeah, it's allowing so it to kind of... That made sense, but I'd not ever, ever thought about that. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, so what's interesting to me is, like, granted... I know that obviously you should be concerned anytime your pet eats something that you're unsure if it's safe or not, but for people like brewed coffee, like how much coffee does the dog have to drink or the cat have to to drink for someone to call? I don't know. The some, poison some. control helpline. Some, you know, uh, grapes. It's the same thing. Chocolate. People are always going to call us, you know, even if it's a you know half a piece of milk chocolate. It's so. just interesting. The whole cleaning uh, products. Yeah, I could see that. Like if you have a bucket of mop water and your dog starts to lick from it. Yeah. Art supplies was for marijuana. Usage was up 102%. Well, not uh, the usage increase. per se, but the... Uh... The dog usage or cat usage. <laughs> um, paint. Wouldn't have really thought that, but maybe they're kind of like kids with markers. They sniff, eat. I, I don't know. They being pets. Cleaning products was number seven. Cocktails was number eight. Vitamin D3, colocalciferol um, was number nine. And then wine because of the sweetness, I guess, whether it's white or red, mm-hmm. uh, was number 10. So, I don't know. That was just kind of uh, interesting. I think it's super interesting, for sure. I wonder sure. If, if the uh, Lance would know this, or you would know this, gaming, all the PlayStation and all that gaming, was that up, down, or the same during this? I would think it would have been up, but I've not heard anything about that. I would think it'd be up as well, especially because, like, last year they had the whole like release of the new Xbox and the new PlayStation and they were like really difficult to get. 
Um, so those... I don't know. I'm guessing, but I would think that they were up for sure. Do you think those games are as popular as they once were, or less popular with the the iPhone or the Samsung phone and everything that you can get on your phone? I would think they're much less popular. I've never I've never played a PlayStation game. Period. I definitely don't think that your phone has anything to do with your game console. You can't game or do anything. You, you can't. You can, but like people who game, they they game on systems because of the quality and the whatever that you're not going to get on your phone. Okay. All right. Obviously, that's not my Yeah, it's definitely thing, so. not my thing for sure, but I do know that your if you're a gamer, like your cell phone is not going to replace your console. Okay. All right, well, are you ready to sign us out of episode 109? Yeah. Did you, um, I totally don't think we mentioned it, but obviously we skipped last week, right? So for those listening. I wasn't going to mention it, but you just did, so Well, yeah. we did. We skipped it. We took a quote-unquote bye week. It's been a while since we've done that, yeah. but we definitely did do that. Um, so thank you for checking in this week. But make sure to check in next week as we discuss more in the news and in our industry. Follow us on Instagram at People Pets and Vets. Follow all of our clinics on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check out our blogs on our website at mygavet.com. And remember, without people, pets are simply animals. Bye, guys.